It's very thankful to me that I'm in a situation now where I don't have to worry about that. Um, all right, so who am I? I wanted to give a little bit of background because I think people know that I you know, helped create this open source project that some of you might use. Um, but I did a whole bunch of other stuff um, as well. And so there's a prehistory. Um, but I've run a lot of systems in production, and a lot of what has gone into the Kubernetes project came out of sort of scars that came from running web search um, in production and running API services. Right now, one of the teams that I run has all of the APIs for Azure coming through it, so around 40, 50,000 requests a second coming through that system. And if it goes down, everything goes down. Um, so it's a nerve-wracking experience. So across that history, I think I've had a lot of, and I should have been on this slide, um, I sh had a lot of experience with monitoring observability, thinking about how we approach these problems of operating software. Um, and I wanted to take a moment and reflect about that. Um, I, what I, one thing I would like to say is this whole thing really makes me very uncomfortable, like being up on stage. When I'm talking about Kubernetes, it's easier. But like when I start giving people advice, um, I feel the need to say sort of like, take it with a grain of salt. I really, you know, this is experience-based. It's not fact-based at some level. Um, and so hopefully it's, it's useful and interesting. Um, so I have another question, which is why are you here? Um, I am fully cognizant of the fact that I am the only thing standing between you and beer or wine or whatever it is out there. Um, and so I hope that in doing this, we're going to be a little bit entertained. Um, and, but I hope that it's not just about entertainment. I actually hope as well that in the course of being entertained, um, you may actually learn something. Um, so that's the, that's the goal is we're going to try and uh, give you some things to think about, some things to talk about um, on your way towards the reception and the rest of the conference. All right, so I wanted to cover some of the themes that I think cover like really percolate through a lot of what everybody is doing um, and what I've been working on for about the last five years. Um, the most important one, the most important theme that I think we should all take to heart, and this is a theme of software engineering in general, I think. This is a theme that has been in software for forever, basically, um, is this idea of decoupling, or you know, in algorithms, they called it divide and conquer. Um, and other people have called it you know, two pizza teams. Like This notion that there's an ideal breakup of how software should look, um, and, and that we should be very crystal clear about the separation between the various pieces and have good contracts in between them is, I think, at the root of all good engineering that we do. Um, and so this is a theme that I think has become very important. Well, it just keeps coming back up and up and up. Every single time there's sort of a new big change in the software industry, I think, you can look back historically and say compilers decoupled us from processors. Object-oriented programming allowed us to express interfaces and decouple our libraries from our applications. Containers allow us to um, decouple you know, the application from the operating system. There's all of the, you know, cloud allows us to decouple hardware ops from the, the idealized notion of a VM. We keep making these layers because the whole stack is too damn complicated. Um, for anybody to even come close to wrapping their head around. Um, but decoupling isn't the only thing that's really valuable. I think one of the more interesting things that's that happened, and Raj talked a lot about open source, um, which is, I think, a really crucial component of a lot of what I have done historically and a lot of what we do in the cloud in general. And I think it's because we've realized that we have to share, right? Like, the number of times you see situations where you're like, why did you build that thing over there? And the person is like, well, because, you know, like, it wasn't quite the shade of green that I, like, the one that I found on GitHub wasn't quite, no. Like, don't do that. We need one thing. We need it to have one good implementation. We need to share our work together. And the reason we need to do that is partially because we simply don't have enough time and energy to build the things that we're interested in if we have to build all of the tools. Like, imagine if you had to build Grafana in addition to building the app that you're monitoring with Grafana. Like, we'd all just be stuck with horrible systems. Um, and then the other important part of that is that specialization is a really important theme throughout everything that I think we hopefully are doing, right? So sharing breeds the ability to specialize. A container allows me to have a team of five people who think about nothing but an operating system, 
right? Not every dev needs to think about an operating system. Not every dev should think about an operating system. The container allows, that decoupling allows me to specialize people on the operating system, to specialize people on monitoring, to specialize people on deployment. This sort of specialization is ultimately really, really good because it enables you to have the time and space and focus to do a really, really excellent job. So sharing helps you take advantage of the knowledge of others, and the specialization via the sharing is what enables us to build really great solutions. So these are some of the themes that I think ring throughout all of the different pieces that we're doing. Um, I wanted to take those themes and sort of apply them to the notion of containers and monitoring. Um, containers are sort of a big deal now, I guess. Um, but I wanted to, to take a step back um, and say, like, why is it that monitoring and, and containers interrelate? Um, one of the most important pieces of the whole container thing, I think, that, that happened that I thought a lot about, actually, was this notion of abstraction. Right? This notion that I could say, hey, you know what? What is a container from my perspective? Well, it's a runnable thingy. Right? It's this thing that I can press the play button on, and interesting things happen. Well, the interesting thing about that is not only is it that a decoupling that isolates me from the program, um, but it is also this abstraction layer that I can start laying interfaces on. Right? And we're starting to see the container edge as being the place where I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to hang a monitoring API. Right? I'm going to hang something like the Prometheus uh, scrape API. And if I hang the Prometheus Scrape API on the edge of my container, suddenly monitoring systems can light up and automatically pull my metrics without really any interaction between the two. Right? So this abstraction boundary becomes this layer of, uh, of hanging these contracts and these interfaces so that people who want to think about monitoring can focus on monitoring. I, as an application developer, can think about the monitoring metrics that I want to expose. And we really don't have to talk to each other. And that's hugely empowering. Um, and this, likewise, this sort of idea of encapsulation, providing this boundary, providing boundaries even within a pod. So it used to be, you know what, you had a monitoring daemon, you had a, a, you know, intrusion detection, you had a log, uh, a log shipper, you had all these different pieces, and they were kind of all mushed up on your machine. Um, and they may even have shared libraries, horrifyingly. Um, I think what the container has come along and done is said, actually, you can ship these as discrete components. You can even share them between teams. Right? So I can have my log shipper be something that is co-developed with a bunch of people around the world. I can have my intrusion detection. I may buy that from a company. And I can have my application container. And they can be individual things built by individual teams, released on their own schedule, deployed into a pod inside of Kubernetes, and I don't actually have to care if they mess around with each other, because again, they're interfacing across these very crisply defined contracts, generally speaking, HTTP APIs, uh, rather than some sort of messy interface where I have to worry about compatibility. So to give some examples of that, imagine that I'm doing something like uh, HTTP monitoring. Right? I can have an application that is talking HTTP, I can have a sidecar that intercepts literally all of the HTTP traffic and records things like 500s. Right? This application doesn't even know that it's being intercepted. It, it is just, and some other team has built this application monitoring sidecar that is, doing, that is exposing all these metrics. So the person who's the app developer writes an HTTP server just like they always did, didn't learn about Prometheus, didn't learn about uh, how to monitor stuff, didn't learn about anything, deploys their stuff into a cluster, and suddenly they have you know, basic HTTP level monitoring. That's hugely empowering. That's a great way, a great demonstration of how decoupling and specialization really lead to better outcomes for everybody. Um, and actually, you can do the same thing on the inbound side too, right? I can serve all my HTTP requests that are coming in, and I can keep track of errors, and I can keep track of you know, exceptions that are thrown and everything else like that. So this is a really great, the, the whole idea of containerizing things, making things into discrete chunks that are decoupled from each other, that we can share and reuse, and that the experts can really build is, is a great move forward in terms of the monitoring and observability of our systems. Um, but it's not just about containers. Um, it turns out that Kubernetes actually plays a really important role as well. And that's because actually the cluster itself is a very important thing. right? Um, and that's because in the, in the real world, this is what happens if you let developers do their own monitoring. Right? Hopefully you can read that. First developer says, I think I'll use stats D. The second developer says, I think I'll use Prometheus. And the third developer says, monitoring? Um, and the operator says, I'm going to quit. Right? And, and this is, I mean, this is reality in all honesty. Right? Um, and the reason for that is because it's very hard to standardize people if 
you're relying on them to A, be informed, and B, to make the right choice. And I don't even mean right in the sense of like there's a correct choice, but just that like a company would say, you know what, Prometheus, you know what, whatever else, right? It doesn't really matter, but what does matter is that there's standardization, because if you standardize, you get specialization, you get expertise, you get knowledge transfer, so that if I move from team A to team B, like the query language looks the same. Um, all these things are hugely valuable, right? In a world of a Kubernetes cluster, I can actually say, hey, you know what, monitoring? I got that. I'm putting it on the cluster. It's a cluster level service. You, app developer, you don't do monitoring anymore. The cluster provides monitoring, right? And in that world, then the app developer says, hey, you know what, I want to create some pods. And they go and they talk to the Kubernetes API server and they create some pods. Cluster wide monitoring is also sitting there inside of the cluster. It can use the API to say, oh, hey, look, new app. New app came into existence, right? It's amazing that we suddenly have this API that is application oriented. I think this is also one of the under uh, sort of appreciated aspects of Kubernetes is that before the world of containers and container orchestrators, all your APIs were infrastructure oriented. You got like virtual machines and virtual NICs and virtual disks and like virtual plus some physical thingy that really had nothing to do with what a developer was doing, right? Now we actually have application-oriented APIs, which means that a monitoring system can say, hey, could you give me all the apps that are running in my cluster? I want to start monitoring them, right? And so the cluster-wide monitoring system detects all the apps that are running, sets up monitoring, may have even also injected that sidecar that does all that HTTP interception that I talked about previously, and then ships all of that cloud monitoring out to you know, SaaS or, or you know, on-prem SaaS or whatever it happens to be. And at this point, your, your app developer has very rich telemetry and monitoring data that is standardized across an entire company, and they have learned, they've learned nothing, and they have done nothing. Right? That's pretty amazing, and that's only possible via what happens through containers and what happens through uh, orchestration APIs. Um, but it's not all a beautiful picnic, um, because what we have discovered the hard way is that um, whilst we were down this, this trend of immutable infrastructure and containers as declarative things, um, when I go in and talk to people now, they're like, well, we did the whole immutable infrastructure thing, and it's working out pretty OK. Um, the trouble is we got all these clusters, and it turns out they're all snowflakes, right? So what we've done is we've sort of, it's good, because we've, we've taken the snowflake, and we've taken the, like, the handcrafted thing, and we've lifted it up to the cluster level instead of the machine level, but now we still have snowflakes everywhere, and we still have the problems associated with snowflakes. And so what we're seeing now in terms of monitoring is that I think we need to extend the notion of what it means to monitor something from being, I want to understand how my application is going, to actually, like, I want to enforce some stuff to make sure that everybody stays about the same. And so one of the things we've been really excited about lately um, has been working on this policy controller with the open policy agent folks um, and to enforce policy for Kubernetes. Um, and I'm going to apologize, actually, I'm realizing I put in that URL optimistically, thinking, Brendan, you should go back and like, make that URL point to something, which I will do after the talk. So if you hit it now, you're going to get a 404, but you know, we'll fix that. Um, apologies. Um, but the combination of a cloud provider providing policy enforcement saying, you know what, you can't turn up a cluster in a, a particular geographic region, or you have to turn up clusters that are at least 10 nodes in conjunction with Kubernetes policy means we can really lock down all of our monitor and lock down all of our clusters and ensure consistency of experience so that not only is there consistency of monitoring within apps deployed to a single cluster, you can actually ensure that exactly the same version of Grafana, exactly the same version of Prometheus, exactly the same monitoring experience is deployed across every cluster, as well as other stuff too, right? Imagine if you want to be able to say, hey, in order to get a public IP address via an external load balancer in Kubernetes, you better also point me at a JIRA ticket where you explained your security profile and why it's okay for you to have a service on the public internet. Right? That's a nice, useful thing to have. Um, and it's only possible through policy. All right, I've been blasting my way through this. I wanted to take a shift from sort of how this technology is um, helping us do a better job of monitoring and maintaining our systems to talk a little bit about my personal experience. Um, and I wanted to start with a little bit of a monitoring story from my past. Um, this is a graph. Well, actually, I drew this graph. But it is representative of a graph that 
uh, will haunt me for the rest of my days. Um, I was building a, a search system. Um, and I'm going to say in a little bit about how important black box monitoring is. We had a black box monitor running. And it would basically post a document, and then it would search for the document, and then it would post a document, and then it would search for you know typical black box monitoring. Um, and there was a steady 0.5% failure in the retrieval rate. 0.5% of the time, the document wasn't in the index when we went looking for it. Now, we, being good engineers, came up with all of the different little race conditions about how, like, well, you could post the document, but the index might not quite have picked it up yet before you go querying for it, and maybe that happens 0.5% of the time. And like, we came up with all kinds of excuses for like, why our system was operating perfectly and still would have this little, little error rate. And, like, and we made ourselves feel really, really good. Like, we, we, we were like, we built a good system. We're monitoring it. Error rate is where we expect it to be. Let's go. It's time to launch. Literally the day before launch. I'm driving out of town because I'm going to a, a conference out of town. Um, that's how confident I was. I'm launching the next day, big press event. I'm headed out of town to a place with really patchy cell phone reception, actually. Um, I'm in the rental car, headed out of town. Calls up. It's the VP. They're doing a dry run of the demo for the press thingy that they're doing the next day. He's like, I posted this thing, and I can't find it in the index. No, wait, I hit refresh. I found it. No, wait, I hit refresh. I can't find it. And I'm like, oh, right? Because I knew exactly what had happened, and I understood the bug that had happened. We, were having, we had some uh, garbage collection that was kicking in too early, effectively, and deleting this document before it was fully in the index. Um, and I turned the car around, and I went home. And fortunately, I knew where the problem was, and I fixed it. And we pushed a new version, and the demo went off um, without a hitch. The moral of the story is, after doing all this, I went back to my monitoring. And you know that 0.5% error rate that was there? It was now zero. Right? So if I had actually paid attention to my monitoring, if I would actually thought, you know what? While I'm lazy and I would love to have a great explanation for why there's this little error rate, I, if I'd actually dug in a few months before, I would have successfully gotten out of town to this conference, had a good time, instead of spending literally the entire night hacking in a fix while frantically talking to the VP and reassuring him that like, it was going to be OK and that he didn't need to cancel with the press and all of this sort of stuff. So that's part of my monitoring story, um, which is to say, if there's something in your data that you can't explain, you should really probably investigate it. The rationalization is not OK. Um, all right, it's a totally true story, too. Um, another thing that I think that we've learned the hard way is having a release dashboard. I don't know how many teams have a release dashboard, um, but it's become now an obligation for every single team that I have to maintain a dashboard of what version of the software is running in every single data center that you are present in. And there's really two reasons for this. One is because if you run a service that's the middleware for an entire cloud, people are always asking you, when is that bug fixed? Where is this bug? When's my feature released? Blah, blah, blah. And it's a total drain on the team. They get all of these interrupts all the time, and they had to go do manual stuff to look up. Oh, we're in three quarters of the data center. The rollout's almost done. It got stalled a little bit, but it'll be OK. Build a dashboard, entirely went away. But the other thing that was interesting when we started building this dashboard is we started realizing that like, we actually had data centers that were weeks out of date. And, and that was pretty embarrassing, too, where we didn't even know, because things got stalled, and then we started a new, like, a build got stalled for long enough, and then we started a new release the next week, but we had never caught up to the old release, and just, you know, bad stuff happens. Um, and so the combination of building this dashboard to answer these questions for people, as well as putting alerting to make sure that if we fell more than a week behind, we would fire an alert that an engineer actually had to, like, get woken up for, um, suddenly, we were kept in sync. And this is valuable, of course, because all of our bug fixes went out, all of our features went out. There was none of these weirdness where somebody hit a particular region and they didn't see a feature, even though they saw it everywhere else. This is a huge insight that I think I just want to share, because it saved me a ton of trouble and saved my team a ton of trouble. I mentioned the black boxing thing earlier. Um, I think it's clear that you want to black box all the things. If you're not doing black box monitoring, or if black box monitoring is the thing that doesn't resonate for you. It's the technique of basically treating your system like it's a, you're a customer, going it with your expe customer's expectations, and monitor what 
if you're actually meeting your customer's expectations. This is the way you find problems, because the trouble is that, like unit tests and like everything else, if you let your engineers build monitoring with knowledge of the system, they will not build monitoring for the places where they have blind spots. Right? It's just natural. You don't think about the blind spot. It's a blind spot. It's called a blind spot. Black box monitoring will find that kind of stuff. Um, and then the last piece is, although Grafana makes really, really beautiful graphs, and I love it for that, I would say, please, as you think about monitoring and everything else like that, beware of the flashy demo. Right? Like any of us who've lived through ops in the middle of the night or real debugging of real systems um, you know, knows that it, something can look really great in a PowerPoint or a demo with the right synthetic data and in the real world turn out to really not be that useful. Um, and I think at mo any operator who's been out there in, in, in the field for an extended period of time can tell you the things that they do for reels when they're debugging stuff versus the stuff that impresses in a PowerPoint demonstration. And make sure that you have that knowledge as well. All right. Um, last little piece. I want to give a little bit of thinking about the future. Um, this is especially speculative. Um, one of the pieces that I think is most interesting as we pursue into this cloud is we're getting closer and closer to this idea that you need to be able to package up a cloud-based application. Helm is part of that, which is a team that, that, that I help lead. Um, but I think broader than just being able to deploy something, we need to start thinking about like if you deploy an app using a Helm chart, shouldn't it come with monitoring too? Right? Shouldn't I be able to get a dashboard? I mean, it's not like you buy a car and you go and you drive the car and like, there's no dashboard, no speedometer, no little alarm lights. Like, part of buying a product or part of using a product is the monitoring that comes with it. And I think we need to start treating these systems because we're going to use more and more off-the-shelf software. We're going to have to make sure that our off-the-shelf software comes with monitoring by default. Um, likewise, I want everybody, hopefully, to be thinking about building reusable components. Um, I wanted to say earlier this, this very important lesson on sharing. There is so much work that we have to do and so much we have to broaden the tent for people who are capable of building distributed systems. If we don't build reusable componentry, if we don't view that as part of our job, um, not only are we going to reinvent the wheel over and over again, we're not going to make the industry broad enough for people to come in and be successful. Um, and then the last thing that I think is interesting is that um, I think we need to be thinking more and more about how can we provide interesting suggestions to people. So one of the most interesting stuff that I've seen coming out of some of the monitoring that we're doing within Azure is combining monitoring and anomaly detection so that you can actually say, hey, look, you know what? Over here, there's something weird in this graph. I don't exactly know what it is, but you might want to look at this. Or I noticed that you use, you, you use these three graphs together, so I'm going to proactively build you a dashboard because I see you flipping between tabs where each of these graphs are open. There's a lot of stuff that we can do with intelligence and suggestions that will lead to better outcomes for people as, again, more and more people who are not necessarily ops experts are coming online into a world where they have to monitor software. Um, I take students who've just graduated from undergrad, and I sit them down, and in a month, they go on call for a service. And I tell them, the good news is you're in a very important service in Azure with a really good op opportunity to influence Microsoft's stock price. The bad news is the only influence you have is down. right? Um, and, and, but they're ready. Right? Because we've managed to build the right tooling in terms of monitoring and actions they can take and insights they can gather, and fortunately, senior leads who are willing to have them call them in the middle of the night, that they can get through that first couple of on-call cycles and actually become very proficient in uh, maintaining the service. So we're done. All right, but I think there's going to be some Q&A. So please feel free. Thank you very much, Brendan. I get to sit on somebody's laptop. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, they say never meet your idols, so uh, kind of forgive me if I'm a little bit nervous. No, no worries. Um, first question. You were like instrumental in building Kubernetes, which has turned into such a massive success. True. Did you ever think it would be like this? Um... I thought it was a really important piece of technology, or, or not necessarily Kubernetes, but the the, the orchestrator, the container orchestrator was a really important piece of technology. And 
it seemed that getting it right meant that it would reshape the way that people use or built systems. Um, so Kubernetes itself was sort of one, could be one of many, I guess, and it happened to be the one that worked. Um, I think there was a lot of fear. I mean, I think definitely I felt a lot of fear early on that um, there would be something that was close enough but not quite right so yep. that everybody would sort of take it over and it would become the thing, but you'd kind of always know that like, it could have been so much more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Um, it, it's been a real ride for sure. Oh, um, I bet. And, and not, I don't think you set out to do that. <laughs> um, so you, you talked a bit at the end, and, and I've seen you talk in the past about making like, the default right way of doing things the best way of doing things. Yeah. And making it easy for people to adopt the right, the correct technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so given that, like, why did you start with pods? Why didn't you start with containers? Like, why did you force people down the slightly harder path? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. There's a couple places where um, we made proactive choices. Pods came in actually really late. And I will have to say, in full credit, it was not me who put them in. It was, it was uh, Eric. I mean, we knew about them, but like, but they weren't there in the API. It was Eric Brewer who said, "No, you have to." And he named them too. Actually, you have to ship. Um, uh, but there's a few places where we made opinionated choices. Um, that and the IP address. Oh my God, we got so much crap early on for um, the IP address per pod thing. Like so, for like six months, people. I, I call it our iMac moment because yeah. I don't know if you remember the iMac, but like I when the iMac, the iMac. I remember. I'm old. Um, <laughs> Uh, I remember the iMac, and when it came out, everyone was like, oh my god, how could they ship a computer without a floppy drive? Right? For like six months. And then after six months, people were like, oh, I guess it didn't really matter. Um, and IP, IP address was the same way. People were like, oh my god, I don't know how I can make my, I don't know how to make my network work with this thing where there's like IP addresses floating all over the place. And then like six months later, people were like, oh, I get it. I get why you did that. Um, and for pods, I think it was similar. It was about this sort of... Um, Sidecars become really important because if, if you build a system where there's lots of libraries where people are talking to each other and those libraries are linked in to the main application, it's very, very hard to influence that team to rebuild their application yeah. to pick up a new version. And I've heard this from a variety of different places, large scale, small scale, a lot of different places where people have said, yeah, no, we had, we had the right thing. We had all these libraries and people could consume all these libraries and put everything together. Um, and you say, like, well, how many different versions did you have active of a particular API? And they'd be like, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven. And you're like, right. that's a problem, right? Yeah, Backward no, compatibility, five, six versions, your team is locked down and they're not making any progress. Yeah. Right? So I think that's part of where it came from, um, a lot of hard-won experience. So this is turning into a bit of a personal like, uh, therapy session about Kubernetes, uh, if that's yeah. right. Um, why did you draw the line in the Kubernetes project at YAML? In, rather than... Than any other like, configuration management system. It seems like so many of the challenges in like, large deployments of Kubernetes could be solved with more sophistication in the config management system. Well, why, I mean, I why is that is out of I mean, there is sophistication, right? I mean, in the sense of deployments. Like, we introduced objects like deployments that right. do rolling updates and stuff like that. Um, I mean, if, it, if you mean instead of building something like, you know, a Terraform or a Ansible or... Or I mean, it, or, uh, you or know, Helm even. Helm, Helm originally Yeah, was. well, I mean, I, I guess I, I, I think one thing is for sure, which is that I believe very strongly in principled layering, right? There, there's, and, and so one of the principles that, that I think we really try and drive home hard in Kubernetes is this notion that if you should only put it in there if 80% of the world agree with you. Right? Um, so cron tabs, so we had this discussion, like, how, how do you draw that line? Cron tabs, cron schedule jobs, totally something you can get into Kubernetes. Because, like, nobody cares about cron. Right? Right. They want to use cron, but nobody, nobody's like, man, if you don't do this particular time format, I'm, I'm walking. No, they don't care. Um, but, like, workflow? Reasonable people may disagree about workflow. Some people like to use, you know, Airstream. Some people want to go use Celery. Like, eh, reasonable people are going to disagree. There's a lot more language in there. That's not something we want in Kubernetes. And I think that config is the same way. I mean, actually, I could tell you stories about wars around configuration language, and maybe that's part of it too. Yeah. Is that like I had the scars of trying to ship configuration languages, and I just knew how, like, it's the programming languages. And programming languages are, have style, and people choose whichever one they like. And so, like, it's not, I mean, I think we should definitely build higher levels of abstraction, but trying to cram them all into Kubernetes is a bad idea. Right? Yeah, so, I agree. Um, and I think you see that with Helm. I mean, Helm has been successful not because it's 
um, you know, not, not because it's theoretically beautiful, but because it's extremely useful. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think every other system that anybody's built has not been successful because they aimed for complexity at the expense of uh, usability. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. So last, last question, I think. Uh, YAML is also the least worst option. <laughs> so. so last question. You, um, I mean, I'm of the opinion that a lot of the success of Kubernetes is from like the very proactive uh, engagement of the community. Yes. And part of that's like obviously starting of the CNCF, Kubernetes being the founding project. And I'm, I'm one of the Prometheus maintainers. I think a lot of the success of Prometheus can be attributed to it being the second project. So I'm getting to a question, I promise. Why did you choose in, in Kubernetes to instrument it with Prometheus metrics from the beginning almost? Um, Why not StatsD? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question. I ran into those guys when they were still at SoundCloud really early on, maybe 2015. It was SRE, uh, it was SRE Con Euro, yep. Europe in Dublin. Yep. Um, and, and that was the first time I saw Prometheus. Um, you know, I, I, I think it just was sort of the, the a choice that we were looking at. It had a lot of the features that we liked um, or thinking about. Um, it seemed like they were approaching it in a more cloud-native way. A lot of the other monitoring solutions that were out there had come at it from a sort of a in the data center view as mm -hmm. opposed to a, a, a cloud-native view. Um, the, I like the application breakdown of like a scrape interface versus where you can you, anybody can target that mm -hmm. scrape interface. Um, it's really, and, and curlability, I'm a big believer in sort of yeah. the value of curlability. Um, so I don't know, that, I, I, don't, I don't remember it being a very uh, well thought out decision, I guess <laughs> is what I would say. Um, it seems it just sort of happened. I don't know that, I, I'm not sure that we, um, that we did it on purpose. Um, cool. So, well, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, Round of applause. Yeah, thank you. I'll be around. <laughs> <laughs>